San Jose headquarters. I am uh, standing in for our venerable EVP of Government Affairs and Policy, Carl Gardino, who is out of the office and unable to join us today. I am really pleased to be joined today by two very special guests, none other than California Lieutenant Governor Eleni Kunalakis and our own Bloom Energy CEO, K.R. Schreeder. Thank you both for joining us here today. Yes, At this time, I'd like to invite uh, Jimmy Apfel, a member of our Government Affairs and Policy team to introduce our special guest today. Jimmy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Justin, can you hear me? Yes. Sounds great. Great. Uh, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce California Lieutenant Governor Eleni Kunalakas. Sworn in as the 50th Lieutenant Governor of California in 2019, she is the first and certainly not last woman to ever hold this office in our state. Before her career in public service, Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis was president of one of California's most respected housing development firms, where she worked for 18 years as a prominent businesswoman. From 2010 to 2014, Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis served as President Obama's ambassador to Hungary, being one of the youngest U.S. ambassadors and the first Greek American woman in such a role. In 2014, Governor Jerry Brown appointed her to the chair of the California Advisory Council for International Trade and Investment. She was then a virtual fellow at the U.S. Department of State Bureau of Intelligence and Research from 2014 to 2017. In addition to being California's Lieutenant Governor, she is currently a director at the Association of American Ambassadors at a National Democratic Institute Ambassador Circle Advisor. Now, without further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Lieutenant Governor Eleni Kunalakis. Welcome, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you so much, Jimmy. It's great to be here with you. It's great to be here with you, KR. And welcome everyone to my office up in Sacramento. Excellent, excellent. We're, well, we're thrilled to have you here today. And thank you, Jimmy, for the introduction. For those who are new to our Empowered Community events, uh, as a reminder of the format for today. So we will work through some questions for both Lieutenant Governor and KR to respond to. We'll follow that with the ever exciting rapid fire lightning round where we hope to get to know our guests uh, on a bit of a personal level. And then we will close with questions from the Bloom team. Uh, please feel free along the way to drop any questions you might have in the Q&A box or the chat box, and we will get to those as time allows at the end of our meeting today. Uh, so let's jump into our first question. Uh, California is a leader in many fields. However, we are also a leader in seeing the devastating impacts of climate change firsthand from both wildfires and drought. How can California leverage its strengths to best address the climate crisis? Carol, let's start with you and then we'll move to Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis. Thank you, Justin. And uh, it is an honor to share the stage virtually with uh, a, a friend and somebody I admire a lot, uh, our, our Lieutenant Governor. Thank you for joining us on this meeting today. And look, when it comes to climate crisis, uh, it is adaptation and mitigation and potential elimination for our children and our grandchildren of the causes of climate change. It is, it is and, 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 it is not an or. I think we have focused in the early days, rightfully so, enormously on the root causes of climate change and how to create technologies such as renewables and other forms of energy to eliminate it in the long term so we can have a decarbonized world. However, the effects of the carbon world that we lived until now are going to be with us for the next two to three decades, no matter what. And adaptation technologies, building resilience into all our critical infrastructure is going to be an absolute necessity to protect people, property, and our prosperity. So it is absolutely necessary that we, just like we showed leadership in thinking about renewables, also show leadership in how we build resilient communities that can adapt to what mother nature is going to, you know, dish up. Thank you, KR. Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis, uh, over to you. 
Well, thank you, Justin, and thank you, KR, and thank you to everybody watching um, for your part, because Bloom Energy is very much on the forefront of these, uh, these very questions. And by the way, uh, for your uh, own um, flexibility during crises, uh, we saw that during COVID-19 and your support of our state and our efforts to provide a PPE and, and the kinds of, um, uh, the kinds of, um, equipment that we needed early on in the pandemic. So it's really a great to be here with all of you. And I'm sorry, sorry, Carl's not here. Kara and I were just talking about uh, family and how family comes first. And we, we all agree. Uh, so I, when I think and talk about the, the question of what California can do and how California can leverage our strengths, I really go back to something very fundamental, which is that since the 1970s, California has had the authority to set our own emissions standards. Now, I was a United States ambassador. Uh, we are the fifth largest economy in the world. We're often called a nation state, but the reality is we work at the subnational level. So having the ability to set our own emission standards, well, that's something that very often happens at a, a country's you know, federal level. So this has been a very important tool for us. And if you look back, it has not just been Democratic leaders. This has been a bipartisan effort to reduce emissions in the state of California. And there have been some incredible iconic leaders in this effort, uh, certainly Mary Nichols, Jerry Brown, and, uh, and now our Governor Gavin Newsom, which in so many ways, uh, you know, we can set these 2045 goals and say, we're gonna be carbon neutral by 2045. And it's great to set those goals and the leaders of the past did that. But now guess what? Somebody's gotta execute in a way that's gonna get us there. And I think that's going to be Governor Newsom's legacy. Uh, and I think he's done a lot already, but there's gonna be, you know, this is really the fundamental questions. So, uh, Justin, you also mentioned the wildfires. You know, I think as rough as yesterday's rainstorm was in the Bay Area and up here in Sacramento, the fact of the matter is that knowing that uh, we are probably done with fire season is a great relief. Um, <clears throat> fire season can be 24 or 12 months out of the year now. Um, but four out of five of the largest wildfires in California history have happened in the last two years. This uh, is a something that is touching everyone um, in, in every possible way. 4% of the state of California burned last year. Uh, it impacts everything from insurance to air quality, uh, to our economy uh, and to our children's health. So, um, so California very much is at the forefront of many different ways. I know we're gonna talk about some of them today, but I think the most important thing maybe just to start off with is that this is a commitment that's gone on now for about 50 years and uh, that it is bipartisan and that we're getting very good at being a leader on combating climate change. Uh, but we have more at stake than most other places as well. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis. Uh, on to our second question of the day. Uh, California is in the midst of an energy transition. In the pursuit of clean, sustainable power generation, we face the challenge of making sure our energy supply is resilient and able to meet growing demand. Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis, what strategies are occurring at the state level to help manage and guide this energy transition and how can we in the business community do our part? Thank you so much, Justin. Well, first of all, you know, as I mentioned before, I think intention matters. Uh, and, and that has now been uh, demonstrated so clearly that, that this is here to stay as an issue for us. Um, but if you look at this year's budget, that's where you will see um, intention turning into action. $15 billion was allocated in this year's budget by the governor and the legislature. Uh, this massive $75, $76 billion budget surplus, $15 billion will go uh, over the next few years uh, into um, clean energy and combating climate change. So this is very, very exciting. Uh, and there are 
a whole bunch of ways that that's going to manifest itself. Of course, a lot of it is resiliency, things like drought response and drinking water supplies, forest resiliency, but a lot of it has to do with the real building blocks of transition to a clean energy future, including about $4 billion in zero emission vehicle investments. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, transitioning to zero emission vehicles is, is critically important. About half of our uh, greenhouse gas emissions in California come from our cars and our automobile and transportation. 40% from the actual vehicles and about 10% from refining all of the oil to service them. Uh, so all of this uh, together, the budget, the intention, and then the policies like the governor's uh, uh, executive order of last year that um, by 2035, all new cars in California will be zero emission vehicles to all of the other things that we're able to do with our incredible research universities and the private sector to invest in the battery technology. And again, I'm gonna hand it over uh, to KR to talk about hardening of the grid and uh, other things that we can do and microgrids, et cetera, to help us get there. Oh, one more quick thing. I co-sponsored a bill um, to push us forward uh, on wind technology and wind turbines. I think this is incredibly exciting. I'm the governor's representative for international affairs and trade. And I had a meeting not too long ago with representatives from the Netherlands who were uh, telling us about uh, some of the, the profile of these offshore wind turbines. They are uh, sited 20 miles off coast and the largest that are uh, in construction and development right now are one and a half times the height of the Empire State Building with wingspan, if you will, of these blades of about seven football fields. If you can just imagine the scope of something like that and what it looks like. Uh, and that our coast, of course, is, uh, you know, we have a very deep continental shelf. We have very specific challenges here, but it's a very exciting time for offshore wind as well. Thank you so much for that unique insight. Uh, KR, the next question is for you, uh, and then followed by Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis. Everywhere we look, the world seems to be in crisis with the compounding issues of climate change, inequality, and COVID-19. As a large and extremely diverse state, California can be seen really as a microcosm for the world. How do we take lessons from ab abroad and apply them to ourselves? And conversely, how can we be leaders nationally and globally? Um, that's a great question, Justin. And um, look, we are fortunate in the last couple of years, and the, you know the 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 governor, the lieutenant governor, has spoken about this very vividly. We found ourselves last March when COVID just hit, of potentially going from a surplus economy to a negative fifty billion dollar from a positive 20 to a negative 50, somewhere in that kind of a range in terms of our budget. We were extremely fortunate that the stock market and the IPOs and the wealth it creates and the taxes it generates has not only wiped off that $70 million swing in a negative direction, but it put it in the positive 50 million, you know, for, you know, 50 billion, which, which, you know, like translates to 120 billion that came from that wealth creation, right? Now, we, we all know from watching the financial cycles, you cannot count on that happening every single time. It is, we are very fortunate in the timing of when that happened and it's going to alleviate a lot of pain. It is going to allow us to invest in the right areas like the Lieutenant Governor talked about. The key question is, uh, while wealth creation can be sporadic, job creation can be sustaining. As a state, are we going to focus on creating those manufacturing jobs and allow this and create the kind of environment that is going to allow a lot of people, not just the few, in the state 
to have the dignity of good work and good pay by creating jobs, uh, manufacturing jobs, middle-class jobs that pay well. Uh, that ultimately is necessary to fulfill any of the good intentions that the governor talked about. So I, I would say that's fundamental to our economy. In addition to, we would want the wealth, we would want the IPOs and we would want the tax benefits out of it. It's an end, but we need the jobs if we need to sustain. Thank you, KR. Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis, you have a, a really unique insight here stemming from your service as a US ambassador. We welcome your perspective here on lessons from abroad and how we can lead nationally and globally. Well, thank you, Justin. Um, look, I, I would not have run for Lieutenant Governor of California if Hillary Clinton had won her election. Uh, she is a friend and a mentor of mine. And uh, after that election went the way that it did, I looked around and said, what can I do? What can I do to continue to advance the American idea? Feels, um, that is a very patriotic American, I believe in. And the answer that I came to was California and that we continue to hold the banner of so much of what is good about our country and that we have the opportunity to continue to show that our model of uh, governance and government and democracy uh, is sustainable over time with very good results. And when I think about this, what I often talk about is um, this, this equation. California is 27% foreign born. 27% of the people of our state were born outside of the United States. My father immigrated from Greece after the Second World War. Uh, he worked as a farm worker. My grandmother never learned to read, uh, but her son could come here, work, and end up uh, at uh, Sacramento State University, get an education, and that changed everything. So immigration plus education, and by the way, there are about 3 million students enrolled in public higher, higher education alone in the state of California. Of those 20 sorry, about 40% are like my father, the first in their family to go to college. I was the first in my family to go to a four-year college and graduate, by the way. Um, but uh, he didn't quite graduate, but he got a great education. But this story, this pathway that I walked of immigration plus education, millions of Californians are on this pathway. And there is no question in my mind that this is what has led to California being the fifth largest economy in the world, the location where the future happen, happens first, our society is enriched and, uh, and our economy continues to grow. So um, I'm, I, I firmly believe uh, in this formula for success. And when it comes to being able to engage during, you know, what, as you noted is, a time uh, where people are concerned about everything, it, it, you know, the lack of predictability and this feeling of chaos. Uh, but when you look at the building blocks of California's success, we are continuing to invest in the very things that have always led to California's success. And uh, by the way, uh, being first and forward leading, leaning in the world on the climate agenda is a very, very big part of this as well. And I hope everyone tunes in uh, to the um, upcoming uh, uh, climate conference, uh, COP26. Uh, Governor Newsom is going to be traveling to Glasgow and he will be speaking on a world stage about these very things. Thank you for that perspective. You have such an inspiring personal story and journey and really appreciate you sharing it with us today. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis and KR, you both have rich careers where you have sought to serve your nation, state and community. As you think on that service, what is a key lesson you've learned about global citizenship? Uh, Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis, let's start with you on this one. Oh my goodness. I, I guess I would go back to something that, um, uh, that Hillary Clinton always considered to be uh, a, a, what she would probably call an organizing principle. 
uh, which is the three-legged stool of democracy that, uh, de that liberal democracies and the American system of democracy is held steady by three legs of the stool that always need to be in balance. One is government, which needs to be responsive and transparent and, and serve the people uh, who put us into place. Um, but secondly, uh, to have a free market economy, that is the economic system that has served American democracy very well, but that the free market system also needs to be in balance uh, with consumer protections and worker protections. Uh, and uh, the third leg of the stool is something in diplomacy we call uh, civil society. And it's interesting because when I was in Hungary, we talked about the importance of civil society all the time. I created an award for, uh, for active citizenship uh, and would go visit with Hungarians who were involved in that civic space and volunteering and, and uh, making sure that their views were known both to the government and to the private sector. Uh, and uh, yet when you when I came home and talked about civil society, well here, America has, has the greatest civil society in the history of the world. American diplomats talk about it around the world. And yet most people have never really even heard the term before. Uh, so that to me is probably the greatest lesson and one that I hope and I believe more people in the United States because of the challenges of our state over the last you know, the last administration, that people understand that all their volunteering and organizing, even just in a forum like this, is really about the development and cultivation and, and strengthening of civil society. Outstanding perspective, thank you. KR, lessons you've learned about global citizenship you can share with us here. You know, uh, those of us who have traveled around have felt, have felt this, known this, but I think across the world, there's a greater awareness today of how connected we are as one people, no matter where you live. COVID has taught us that, right? Uh, uh, you know, uh, we're all, either we're all safe together or we're not safe together. It's not somebody being safe and somebody not being safe. We're all connected. Uh, the same applies to climate change. There is one atmosphere that we all share what happens in China and India or what happens in the Amazon rainforest is gonna affect us. This is uh, not, this is a, th that's the connectivity, the connectedness of the global population. And for me, there's an optimistic note there in that forget the existing governments at any point in time, the people, they all care about the same things. They, they want a good family, they want a stable family, they want their children to better, do better than what they did. That's a common universal value. So if we start with what we share in common and we build on it, I think our next generation is gonna be a lot better than we were to, serve, to some extent in our generation to build that. So I'm very optimistic, but that global lesson to me is more and more, we as a population, we as a human race, are going to understand how connected we are and how we have to watch for each other and take care of each other. Thank you, KR. One last question before we move on to the ever exciting lightning round. Uh, what can you share with us about being diplomatic and respect, uh, respectful with others in both professional and casual settings? Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis, uh, as you are a former diplomat, let's start with you on this topic. Well, let me just start uh, by saying, Kara, I really appreciated your comments just there and the idea that nothing is connecting us globally more than the common threat of a changing warming uh, climate. Um, and that we all truly do want the same things. We want, we want stable societies where we can raise our families and our children with the hope that they can uh, achieve more than their parents did. I, I really love hearing that from you because whether it's the son of India, our daughter of Greece, uh, we are Americans and, and we have the ability to remind the world of this. Uh, and frankly, I think that's what a lot of what diplomacy 
does and American diplomacy tries to do. Um, I, I will say this, though, to the answer to your question. Uh, so Plato was a skeptic of democracy, and he um, believed that democracy was not uh, a reliable enough system of government because it was only, always one step away from chaos. And that, I'm sorry, from, from autocracy, from tyranny, and that middle step was chaos. And so if there is one thing that maybe as a former diplomat, I can, and tr I try to remind people is that chaos is our enemy as well. And autocratic leaders promise stability to their people. They say too much chaos, too much corruption, too much disagreement. You want, you want things to calm down. You want predictability. Give me the power. I alone can fix it. And Viktor Orban in Hungary promised that to his people. And they gave it to him through a free and fair election and have continued to endow him with that authority in their name. Uh, we see this, uh, we saw this with the last administration, I alone can fix it, that appeals to people. And so what's important to me in diplomacy is wherever you are on the, uh, you know, American spectrum of democracy, which goes, you know, certainly we, we are a two-party system. So this goes not just for Democrats, for Republicans as well, that our system of democracy uh, relies on us to be able to show, you know, as Abraham Lincoln is reported to have said, that democracy is not chaos. And that means that government and the people we represent and our free market economy are able to work together to improve the lives of our people and uh, to ultimately deliver that this system of government has to deliver. And so we have to be able to work together to solve problems, large and small. Wonderful perspective, thank you. KR, what can you share with us about being diplomatic and respectful of others? So um, uh, that, was, uh, that was really insightful, especially given what we're seeing around the world, whether it's Brazil, whether it is uh, you know, so many parts of the world, uh, that was a great perspective, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so let me take a very different, uh, uh, not, not a point of view. It is, it is more a, what do we do in everyday life with, with, like, with like diplomacy and, and like respect, which is more the realm that I deal with, whether it's a commercial setting or a, or a like business setting. Um, just before we got online, the Lieutenant Governor and I were sharing our common respect and a deep sorrow for losing our good friend, uh, you know, General Paul. And uh, in this particular area, for me, it's about the Paul Doctrine, okay? You need to be extremely strong and you need, you need to understand your strength. But you're always a reluctant warrior. You don't want to get into a fight. You're, you're first a diplomat before you wear your soldier's uniform, even when you're the soldier with the biggest, nastiest, uh, you know, weapons that you have, right? And uh, never use it, try, try to never use it, find the, find the, common, find the common thread, use, use diplomacy, use that as a strength. So in our everyday life, when we walk into a room, we know what our strengths are, being able to show that with restraint, but with integrity, but trying to find that common ground and middle ground where you can find a win-win. That, that's really, at the end of the day, what moves the ball forward rather than a win-lose. I don't think in, in our modern world today that everything is so asymmetric between cyber warfare to anything else. Uh, I don't think if you if you, if if there is a win lose proposition that works. 
Thank you, KR. Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis, I know KR mentioned uh, the passing of General Powell. We wanted to offer you a moment to, to, to share some of your stories uh, of your time with him. Well, uh, you know, um, we lost two former secretaries of state this year. Uh, we lost um, Secretary Schultz uh, and we lost uh, Secretary Powell. And um, they, during my time at the State Department, they were regularly cited as the two greats. Uh, and uh, of course I have, I work with Secretary Clinton. She was my, you know, she is so dear to me and, and such an inspiration to me, but these two uh, secretaries really left a mark on the State Department and all the diplomats who, who have come after have known both the Powell Doctrine and the Schultz Doctrine. Uh, and um, they both had a vision uh, certainly Secretary Powell for the ex excellence of America as the indispensable nation, uh, as the shining city on the hill. And even with the mistakes that we have made, uh, there is no question that they believed in the promise of our country. And that's a, a legacy that it's up to the next generation to continue uh, to advance. Thank you to you both for sharing your perspective. Um, as a reminder, we will take your questions at the end of our time together today. So please feel free to share those in the Q&A box as we go through this meeting. Uh, now on to the, the most exciting portion of our program together, the very exciting and fast paced lightning round. Uh, I will ask each of you a series of eight quick questions with the intent to get to know you on a more personal level. Uh, I'd ask that you each try to limit your responses to one word to a sentence. Uh, KR, let's start with you as the veteran of the lightning round. Uh, where does your energy and tenacity come from? Coffee, tea, or something else? Since uh, I can't make a Greek coffee in the morning because it's pretty elaborate, I would say my espresso is what I go with in the morning, and that's what gets me going. Is that a single shot or a double? Double shot. Uh, double shot. Live it's it. too little. I would, I would, would like it injected, but I take it off the cup. Living precariously. <laughs> uh, Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis, how about you? Where does your energy and tenacity come from? Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, exercise, sleep, coffee, and chocolate. Not necessarily in that order. <laughs> All at the same time. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, let's go right back to you, Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis. Uh, who is your role model? Uh, so I, I mentioned Hillary Clinton, Nancy Pelosi, uh, 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 Senator Dianne Feinstein. Um, those three probably women of that generation have inspired me a lot in my life and are all good friends. All remarkable women in their own right. Thank you. Uh, KR, who is your role model? Well, if you just go to the blast page of our website, you'll see his picture. He, you know, we just put him on. And I, I just call them our chief mission officer and our chief values officer. For the last 15 years, as a personal mentor and a friend to me, the amount of time he has given and what he has taught me is amazing. General Paul. Thank you, KR. Uh, Kara, let's stick with you. Uh, what is your favorite California sports team? That's a, that's a hard one. It's uh, <laughs> between the Warriors, the Sharks, and the 49ers. Don't ask me to choose. So, so let me put that trifecta there in different sports. So, so at least I'm being fair here of saying it's the 49ers, not the Raiders. Sorry, Raiders fans. Uh, it, is, you know, it is the Warriors and it's the Sharks. Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis, I, I hate to even ask you this question. Oh, it's a trouble, Justin. It's a trouble question to ask a politician this question, but uh, do, you, do you have a, a choice here or do you like them all? I represent the entire our beautiful <laughs> state. I root for every California team. My favorite is uh, the Stanford fencing team because my kid fences on it. <laughs> You know what? We can't argue with that, can we? 
Uh, excellent. And a great answer, by the way. You can tell why you have such a high favorability rating amongst your constituents. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, excellent. So let's stick with you. Uh, what is your, uh, Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis, what is your favorite city outside of the U.S. that you have visited? I, I love Athens. Uh, it is a second home to me. Excellent. KR, how about you? Rome. Excellent. Uh, KR, as you think about uh, skills that you want to develop more, and you've shared some with us in the past, uh, what is at the top of your agenda right now as a skill you want to develop further? I keep trying and I fail. I have to listen more. Excellent. Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis, how about you? Patience. Thank you. What is a movie you have never gotten tired of? Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis, over to you first. What immediately comes to mind is our family movie, uh, The Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou. Great film, great film. Kara, how about you? Favorite movie? You, you know, because it's such a slapstick and there is so much that you miss every time and say, oh, I, now I understand what they meant, <laughs> especially being an immigrant coming without context and having watched it multiple times, airplane. And, K, and, KR, does, and KR does reference airplane quite frequently in meetings. That's it awesome. does. Yeah. It's a funny movie. Um, great. You both work really hard, but if you ever were to get a day off, what would that look like ideally for you, KR? You know, being with family and friends, uh, cooking and sharing a great meal and having some great California wine. Excellent. Lieutenant Governor, how about you? Uh, sounds like the perfect day for me to you, <laughs> you, you all can share that together on your next day off. <laughs> we've been meaning to, so uh, we've, we've had a rain check once, so we'll, 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 we'll plan that. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis, what motivates you in the morning? Um, well, I, I love being Lieutenant Governor of California, our state, the promise of our state, all we've been and all we can be. Excellent. KR, how about you? It is the possibility of what can be. That's what every morning means to me. Uh, I'm an abundance guy. I believe tomorrow is always going to be better than today. So when I wake up in the morning, it's a new tomorrow. Great. Thank you both for entertaining us with the lightning round. That concludes our list of lightning round questions. Uh, so for our, our last segment in time together, we'd like to get to, with the, the balance of time, some employee questions, uh, which we will curate in the Q&A box as well as the chat box. So for employees out there listening, please feel free to drop those in now. Uh, first question, and we will throw this one over to UKR. What is something you've learned about leadership uh, from your time uh, running Bloom Energy? Um, it's mainly your job really is to enable everybody around you to do better and succeed. And that's leadership is predominantly that enablement role or the servant leadership role is what leadership is about. Thank you, KR. Lieutenant Governor Kunalaka, same question to you. Uh, tell us lessons you've learned about leadership from your career as a public servant. Well, I have my MBA from UC Berkeley and we learned um, of how powerful it is uh, to work within teams. Uh, I'm, I'm a big, big believer uh, that a good leader is a, a person who builds a team with respect, uh, honoring one another for your talents, uh, not picking on people for shortcomings and focusing on the mission. Excellent. Thank you. Kara, this question comes in for you. What is a challenge to creating resilient and sustainable energy that you do not think gets enough attention currently? Look, uh, 
when we look at take for example the current grid right uh, you know you know this was a question that the Luton governor was looking for me to answer but we just moved on to the next one so i think it's a great question i'm happy to answer when you think of the macro grid that the way it exists uh, today electricity is essential for everyday life but it is even more so in mission critical applications and infrastructure a hospital a bank grocery stores where people are going to depend for food and if electricity is not there the food is going to uh, you know go bad there are mission critical or shelters we are after all an earthquake country wildfire country uh, you know emergency shelters old age homes schools where you know kids are there these are mission critical infrastructure if you think of security which is another way to think of infrastructure you're not going to protect every home the same way you protect your bank and your and your jewelry store there's a higher level of security that you have to provide because you obviously want to improve the security of your entire community but nevertheless you cannot provide that same level of security everywhere without it being cost prohibitive you're going to do that selectively to create pockets of resiliency today we don't have a policy for pockets of resiliency those are microgrids the microgrid exists in conjunction with the macrogrid and we don't have that that's something we need to create when it comes to energy because the world has gone digital digital runs on electricity so electricity is a human need thank you kr lieutenant governor kunalakas the next question comes in for you what is something you are most proud about that you are working on right now to help California's fight against climate change? So we had a really big legislative year uh, and I had the opportunity to, um, uh, with our team, sponsor and co-sponsor legislation. Um, some of that had to do with public higher education. I sit on the CSU, the UC and the community college. My, you might not, immediately recognize the connection between uh, combating climate change and public higher ed in the state, but we also have three national laboratories under the purview of the University of California. I'm the, uh, uh, the, the vice chair of the committee at the UC Regents, uh, and I see this next generation of young people coming up through our system who are absolutely committed to uh, their future work on uh, this uh, area, whether it's as, as scientists or as business people um, or as consumers. Uh, so that is really exciting to me. But I mentioned before this offshore wind, uh, I co-sponsored the uh, legislation to help move forward with a major, major offshore wind projects. So that's an area that I'm very, very excited about. Thank you for sharing that and for your continued service on our behalf. KR, what, you've been doing this a long time, obviously, uh, more than 20 years with Bloom Energy. What are you most struck by, by how the conversation has evolved on climate change and energy over the last two decades? So uh, I think the briefcase is closed in terms of, is, is climate change real? Is it man-made? I think the briefcase is closed on the sale being made to the public about we need to decarbonize. Uh, I, I don't think we need to relitigate that. The question though is how now? How do you go from where we are to where we need to go? That's so that's what's happened in the last 20 years. In the last 20 years, you had to, that sale was still not made to the public at large. Today, I think that sale's been made. But this next phase of do we understand and do we know how to make the transition correctly is a big one. And I don't think we, we can, reasonable people can still agree on what that transition looks like. And that is where 
the world leaders, the business leaders, uh, the community leaders need to uh, get together. It's a complex issue because it's not just a climate issue. It's an energy issue and an energy issue is an economy issue. It's the haves and have nots issue. It's the inclusiveness issue. It's the environmental justice issue. It's everything. So it, it weaves so much into our fabric in so many dimensions that that informed uh, consensus on at least the things we can agree upon uh, is what is lacking today. So that's the next step. Thank you, KR. Last question uh, to Lieutenant Governor. Uh, I think I think maybe the maybe the Lieutenant Governor may want to answer that because that's so important. No, I I, I think you're exactly right. And you know, again, even in my offshore wind answer, we have to have the cables that come back to the state, and we have to be able to funnel that uh, electricity into the grid. We have a lot of work to do. When you think of um, you know, for any, and I imagine a lot of you like me, plug your car in at night, uh, you know how much energy a car takes to charge, uh, and then get on the freeway and look at all those cars that are not uh, uh, plugging in, and just to consider the enormous need uh, to produce electricity in order to be able to truly uh, get to our 2045 goals, it's going to be a huge uh, challenge. And so I think you're right. The briefcase is still open on this. Yeah. Last question for Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis. There's a lot of, of course, doom and gloom about the environment and about the challenges that are ahead of us. As you think about this from a positive standpoint, what are you most excited about for this future of energy transition that we're in currently? Um, well, look, we've, we've talked a lot about different things and I've had, I, I toured a, a battery storage um, plant manufacturing facility here in the state. Uh, the, the, the innovation economy of our state um, inspires me all the time and I never know when I'm going to intersect with it. Um, sometimes it's Japanese diplomats talking about, uh, about hydrogen power and their vision for the future, which Germany, of course, is. Uh, sometimes, like this morning, I, I had the um, uh, ambassador from Kazakhstan in my office. You know, that's a major brown economy is how he put it. But he said that they have their 2060 goals of being carbon neutral. Um, but the most excited I get is when I am with the next generation, our students, and they, they have a vision for the future that it is, it is immutable. And they have a commitment to putting their own talents and efforts uh, into this fight. Uh, and that more than anything else, um, that no matter how, uh, concerning the news might be about this or that in, in the challenges um, that I am confident, uh, as KR noted, that the future is going to be better because the young people with the talent and the energy, with the support of society around them, uh, can, can continue to lead and affect great change the way that generations before have. Thank you for leaving us with that uplifting message on, on positivity, really. Uh, thank you for both of you for your perspective today. We, we have reached the end of our journey together. Uh, I'd like to welcome two of our Bloom team members to join us now, Andrea Rodriguez and Selwyn Simmons, to close us out today. Thanks, Justin. Uh, I want to again thank Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis and our CEO, K.R. Shridhar, for joining us today and sharing their ideas and thoughts and insights. I was struck by the Lieutenant Governor's remarks on how the state can help manage and guide the energy transition, specifically uh, her remark that intention matters, something I believe personally. 
uh, that the state budget uh, more particularly has allocated $15 billion uh, to clean energy and combating climate change and providing the building blocks for the clean energy future, uh, like clean energy vehicles, uh, as well as offshore wind power is both real and exciting. Uh, budget intention policy, those three, uh, those three words, I think, envelop uh, the approach that was, uh, that was shared. Uh, I was also excited to learn KR's thoughts on how California can leverage its strengths to address the, cl the climate crisis, most notably on adaption, mitigation, and elimination uh, of the causes of climate change, ultimately applying uh, adaptation technologies to protect people, property, and prosperity to build resilient communities. Uh, it's truly been a pleasure to learn from both our guests, and I'm grateful for the visionary ideas uh, that they've shared with us uh, this afternoon. Thank you, Selwyn. Andrea? Yes, definitely. Thank you again, uh, Lieutenant Governor Kulanat-Malis for being here um, and joining our employee town hall today. I think these conversations are um, an integral part of the work that we do here at Bloom. Um, and thank you, KR, for engaging in the conversation as well. I'm constantly impressed with the ground that you're able to cover with our elective leaders here. Um, I was personally impressed um, with your uh, both of your responses to lessons to lead um, you know, nationally, I think, um, you know, KR to your perspective of being able to have job creation and be able to sustain that um, through all of the crisis that we've experienced, um, you know, the past two years, um, you know, is definitely struck by your comment there. Um, and uh, Lieutenant Governor, I was also impressed by um, your response of your success for um, your formula for success. And um, I too am a daughter of uh, immigrants and I definitely resonated with that story and, um, and just inspired by you know, what you can do to advance um, the American ideals here as we kind of hold that banner of, of what is good. Um, so thank you uh, both um, for your leadership. Um, I think these conversations will continue to lead um, innovations and, and foster um, community relationships. So thank you. Thank you, Andrea. And thank you again to our guests today, Lieutenant Governor Eleni Kunalakis, Bloom CEO, K.R. Schreeder. And thank you all for your great questions and participation today. In the words of the great play-by-play -play announcer, Jim Fife, our time is up and we thank you for yours. Goodbye, everyone. Have a great day. I will, I'll try to find the video and send it to you, uh, Talk Thank to you soon. Thank you. Thank you, KR. Great to Talk see you everybody. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.